All right. Well, we live in a fallen world, obviously. We deal with uh, all kinds of evil and tragedy and wickedness. We deal with things like homicide, genocide, fratricide, suicide. There's sexual abuse, uh, child abuse, spousal abuse, elder abuse, drug abuse, uh, terrorism, racism, materialism, hedonism, narcissism, manipulation, exploitation, starvation, isolation, and discrimination, and that list could be a very long list. We live in a world that is rife with every form of tragedy and wickedness imaginable. And the thing that all of these various evils have in common is that they're perpetrated by human beings. Uh, human beings are the ones who are doing the abusing and the oppressing and the killing. And when you follow all of these instances of evil in the news cycle, uh, it can be particularly discouraging. If you're uh, someone who just, you sort of just want to live at peace and you want to enjoy your family, you want to have the freedom to pursue a better life, uh, all of these things obviously threaten that vision. And uh, if your faith is in Jesus Christ and you want to see God's grace manifested in the world and you understand that God's blessings come when people live according to his word, then you see all of these things in the world and the world is walking in such diametric opposition to God's word, uh, it can become easy to become discouraged. And, and that's only speaking about hearing about things in the news cycle because there are times when uh, we live in this fallen world and these types of things come and they touch us or our families or people that we love. And, and so again, it can be easy to become discouraged. And so the question then becomes, okay, where do we turn? To whom do we look in the midst of this sort of evil and chaos? And how precisely does the Lord address the problem of evil in the world? And that is the subject toward which our text for this morning is directed. So uh, let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. This morning we'll be looking at verses 1 through 14. As we've been studying the book of Daniel, we've seen uh, stories about Daniel and his friends. We've read about uh, Daniel and his experience in the lion den. We've read about uh, Daniel's uh, friends and their experience in the fiery furnace. We've read about uh, dreams and the interpretation of those dreams. Daniel 7, however, marks an important turning point in the book of Daniel. And with uh, Daniel 7, we actually have a change in the literary genre of the book of Daniel. Uh, with Daniel 7 and the chapters that follow, Daniel writes in the form of a literary genre known as apocalyptic literature. Uh, you might remember that when we studied the book of Revelation several, several years ago, I said that the book of Revelation was apocalyptic literature. And although the book of Daniel is uh, several hundred years earlier than the book of Revelation, it was written over 600 years before the book of Revelation, uh, the literary genre is quite similar. Uh, the word apocalyptic Apocalyptic, of course, is uh, a, a word that is used in modern English. In fact, my daughter used the word just yesterday. Um, and, and when we speak of things that are apocalyptic in nature, the word has connotations of catastrophe and destruction and the end of the world. right? And that's generally true of Jewish apocalyptic literature. We saw that in the book of Revelation, and we'll see it in our text as we continue our study in the book of Daniel. Uh, of course, as we've been looking at Daniel, we've seen that the book of Daniel is designed to provide encouragement and instruction to the people of Israel who are living in exile. They've been taken out of the promised land. They're living in Babylon, and uh, the Lord is providing what he provides in the book of Daniel in order to encourage and instruct them regarding how they are to live as they're in exile. And, and the primary way that Daniel accomplishes this is by underscoring God's sovereignty over the affairs of the nations, the fact that the nations are in the Lord's hand and he is ultimately in control of these things. God is sovereign over the king of Babylon. He's sovereign over the, the king of Medo-Persia. He's sovereign over the rise and the fall of nations. 
And, and yet in the previous chapters, the way that God's sovereignty has been presented in, in Daniel is that God steps in and he intervenes in the actual affairs uh, at that time in the actual circumstances that are taking place. And so as we enter into Daniel 7 and we begin to look at the apocalyptic writings, uh, we see something a little different. We see uh, visions that present analogies and symbols. And rather than explaining the way that God steps in and intervenes, uh, we see how there's a spiritual cosmic battle that's taking place behind the scenes. And uh, because apocalyptic literature conveys truth through symbols that provide various analogies, uh, there's a sense uh, of mystery regarding how these things play out in, in real life. Because uh, whenever you have an analogy, obviously the analogy breaks down at some point. And, and so it leaves us with the question of what exactly should be understood by the symbols that are presented in, in the vision. And yet, nevertheless, these visions and the symbols and the metaphors, they do convey God's truth. They are divinely inspired. They're designed to provide the same kind of comfort and instruction and encouragement to the people of Israel in exile uh, that the rest of the book of Daniel provides. And, and ultimately, they were revealed by God to instruct all of God's people from all times and places with regard to how we are to live and how to, we are to uh, think about this world in which we find ourselves. So let's look at the book of Daniel, chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his head as he lay in his bed. And so we, we talked about Belshazzar in uh, Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar was the king who hosted that great feast where he had the utensils that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem, brought out and used in the feast. And uh, Belshazzar was the one who received the vision of the handwriting on the wall. Uh, but then, so that was Daniel 5. Then in Daniel 6, we were introduced to King Darius, and uh, Darius was the king over the Medes and the Persian. This was the king who uh, followed the, the kingdom of Babylon. And so uh, all of that's to say that the narrative in Daniel doesn't take place in a strict chronological order. Uh, the narrative doesn't unfold in the same order as the events as they happened. And so now he's taking us back to a time that actually precedes the episode of the handwriting on the wall. And uh, what takes place in Daniel 7 comes after the events of Daniel chapter 4. It comes before the events of Daniel chapter 5. Uh, again, it says in verse 1, these things happened in the first year of King Belshazzar. Again, verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Um, continuing to verse 1, it says, Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then I looked. Its wing, then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. Uh, like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, the second one, like a bear. Uh, it was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up from among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So uh, Daniel's vi vision begins with these four winds churning up the sea and its uh, chaotic waters. 
And in uh, biblical times in ancient Israel, the sea was sort of viewed as a, kind of an evil and chaotic place. Uh, the Israelites were not seafaring people, generally speaking. They obviously had boats. They went out on the sea, but their boats were used for more practical and localized and limited purposes. Uh, their economy wasn't dependent upon their seafaring ability. Their ability, to, their ability to build ships was limited. They didn't have a navy. And yet there were other cult cultures, probably uh, the Phoenicians most famously, who were very adept on the sea. And so from the perspective of the Israelites, the sea was a dangerous and chaotic place. And in fact, it was connected to the, the underworld. And, and so when the Bible talks about the sea, it's generally understood to be a place of evil and chaos, which is why in uh, Revelation 13, that this uh, evil satanic beast it talks about there is portrayed as arising from the sea. Uh, it's why... It says in the New Testament that in the new creation in, Revel in Revelation 21 that there is no longer any sea. And uh, again, it might seem odd to us that when Jesus casts out the legion of demons and they go into the herd of swine, that they go rushing into the sea. Uh, it probably wouldn't seem nearly as odd if the ground opened up and these demons charged into a bottomless pit. Right? That would uh, be more appropriate to us in some ways because when we think about the underworld or the abode of the demonic forces, we tend to think of the, the depths of the earth. And of course, we know that there's not a literal realm of demonic forces or a little rel literal realm of the dead that we could physically dig down to and access uh, but we do have that association. And, and likewise, we tend to think of the realm of God as being associated with the sky, right? I remember when I was a kid, we, we flew to California and it was my first time on an airplane. And uh, my parents told me that we would be above the clouds. And I asked them if we would see God when we were up there. Right. And, you know, we don't literally think that God is in the clouds, but in terms of the, the location of heaven, that's sort of what we think about. Right. And when the Bible talks about uh, Jesus ascending and he goes up into the sky, we don't think anything about that. That seems perfectly reasonable. Uh, or when the Bible talks about his return and how he will come on the clouds, we don't think that's weird. And in uh, Revelation, when we read about Jesus casting uh, Satan into the bo bottomless pit when we read about the, the demonist locust hordes arising from the bottomless pit, uh, that too seems appropriate. And, and so likewise, if we understand that in the minds of the original readers, the depths of the sea were connected to the underworld and the sea was viewed very strongly as a place of evil, then when we look at the four winds churning up the sea in this vision that God gives to Daniel, we can understand that in the minds of the original readers, this provides a very sense of foreboding evil and chaos. That's sort of the, the setting for the vision. And then coming up out of the sea, there are these four beasts. And the, the way that the beast themselves is presented is very evil and chaotic, right? These beasts are abnormal. The, these beasts are a perversion of God's creation. In uh, Genesis 1, God creates each creature to produce after its kind. And yet these beasts are a mix of different kinds. Uh, and, and, you know, you can just think about passage uh, passages in the Old Testament that instruct the people of Israel to keep things in order, right? And they're not to plant two kinds of seed in the same vineyard. Uh, they're not to plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Uh, they're not to wear clothing made out of two different kinds of materials. And, and yet here we have these beasts that are a mix of different species. And, and the vision combines the parts of these various creatures to create this unsettling image of these destructive beasts arising out of the evil chaos of the sea. Right? That's, that's the picture. It's a picture of evil and chaos with these mutant beasts arising out of the evil and chaos to bring destruction. Now, uh, if you remember in Daniel 2, 
uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and the statue, he dreamt of the statue. It had a head of gold, a chest of silver, a midsection of bronze, uh, legs of iron, and then feet of iron mixed with clay. And, and you can certain, certainly see the similarity between uh, that vision and the vision that Daniel is given here. In fact, the fourth beast in our text for this morning has iron teeth and Uh, Some have even observed a connection between the fact that the feet of the statue probably had uh, ten toes, and so too here, the fourth beast is said to have ten horns. And uh, if you remember my my teaching on the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, uh, we talked about how some interpreters understand the four kingdoms to be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Other interpreters understand the four kingdoms to be Babylon, Uh, Media, Persia, and Greece. And and then a third way of understanding it is that you just don't try to align the kingdoms with any particular set of kingdoms. Instead, you see them as sort of symbolic of the kingdoms of the world more broadly. And and so, you know, that same debate that applied to Daniel 2 also applies here with regard to the beasts. And if we're trying to understand the meaning of the text, then when the text was originally written, the original readers, they obviously didn't have the benefit of our hindsight. And, uh, and so trying to figure out the identity of the kingdoms, that wasn't something that was in view for the original readers. And honestly, I don't think the point of the text is really to underscore the identity of the coming kingdoms. And uh, if that's true of Daniel 2, it's probably all the more true of Daniel 7 because, again, apocalyptic literature conveys truth by analogy. And sometimes it's difficult to see exactly where the analogy uh, breaks down. And and so one of the problems with the way that some interpreters uh, read apocalyptic literature is that they try to push the interpretation too far and find a corresponding historical event or a historical uh, item for every detail in the passage. And so in this passage, the, the three ribs of the second beast have been identified with three particular military victories of Medo-Persia. Other interpreters have identified the three ribs with three nations that were allies of the Medes. Uh, The four heads of the third beast have been associated with four kings of the Persian Empire, but then others have identified the four heads as four generals who took control of Greece after the the death of Alexander the Great. And so the, the fact that these details aren't even clear to us, right? And we have the benefit of hindsight um, is probably a good indication that we shouldn't try to press these details too far. Uh, The genre of literature is intended to maintain a sense of mystery, and I think that all of that goes to show is that uh, these visions weren't probably intended to convey that level of clarity. And so this, I think, is especially true given the fact that the original readers, you know, they didn't have our hindsight. And so while I think it's probably prudent to understand that the four beasts do correspond to the specific kingdoms that arose, um, it's probably also and perhaps even more important to understand that these kingdoms represent the kingdoms of the earth more broadly. And what is true of these kingdoms is ultimately true of all of the kingdoms until the end of time. And so kingdoms will arise. These kingdoms arise out of the evil and the chaos that is at work in the world. They stem from human pride and selfish ambition and the desire for power. The beasts are satanic. Their desire is to control and devour. And uh, and in the context of the book of Daniel, their target is the people of God. They make war against those whose faith is in Yahweh. Now, uh, continuing in verse 9, it says, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. So 
What, what a contrast, right? Daniel goes from a vision of the evil and the chaos of this fallen world with the satanic mutant beast rising up out of the chaotic sea. He goes from that to a vision of the throne room of God. And the way that the throne room is uh, structured in this vision is as a courtroom that is prepared for the Lord to execute judgment. Uh, and we see the power of the Lord to execute judgment in verse 10, where it speaks of uh, a thousand thousands who served him and 10,000 times 10,000 who stood before him. So uh, a thousand thousands is a million, 10,000 times 10,000 is a hundred million. Uh, these are angelic beings. And so it's a picture of these myriads of angels at the Lord's beck and call, willing to execute his judgment in accordance with his commands. Verse 11, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So uh, I'll say more about the fourth beast and the little horn uh, next week, but but here we see God's power over the kingdoms of this earth. We see God's power over human evil, and we see the contrast between human evil and the righteous judgment of God. Uh, God is sovereign. He is in control. He is bringing justice upon his enemies in his time. He allows the evil and the chaos of this world uh, for a, a period, but ultimately their dominion will be taken away. Uh, and yet notice in verses 13 and following, the Lord will establish a new kingdom. Verse 13, Daniel says, I saw in the night visions and behold, the clouds of heaven, there, uh, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So we see here that there's this new figure, this one uh, coming on the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, and he comes before the throne, which is striking, right? Because in the, the history of the Bible, every human being who is confronted with God on his throne falls before him in fear and trepidation. And yet the Son of Man boldly approaches the Ancient of Days. He boldly comes before the throne of the Almighty. And, and it's kind of interesting that the Son of Man is coming on the clouds because uh, in the Old Testament, it is God alone who comes upon the clouds. In Psalm 68, it says, exalt the one who rides on the clouds in reference to Yahweh. In Psalm 104, it says that the Lord makes the clouds his chariot. In Isaiah 19, the Lord rides upon a swift cloud. Nahum chapter one, the clouds are the dust of his feet. And so the, the text presents the son of man in divine terms in the sense that he is the one who rides upon the clouds and he approaches the ancient of days who is himself divine. And I think it's noteworthy here that the, the vision that the apostle John receives in uh, Revelation chapter one, which uh, Shonda read for us early as part of our scripture reading, uh, in, in Revelation one, it presents the son of man from this passage as having the characteristics of the ancient of days from this passage. So in Revelation 1, uh, beginning in verse 12, the apostle John says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. What do he look like? He was clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his waist. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow, his eyes a flame of fire. And so that, that description contains four or five allusions to the appearance of the Ancient of Days here in uh, Daniel 7. And I, I think uh, we see a, a seed for understanding that the, the Son of Man is the Ancient of Days in the fact that the, the Son of Man in Daniel 7 is 
riding on the clouds in the way that only God himself uh, is said to do in scripture. And uh, this is really part of the way that apocalyptic literature works. Apocalyptic literature layers metaphors. And so in Revelation, when um, the, there's this, this heralding that the, the lion of the tribe of Judah has come, immediately after that, John looks and he sees a lamb standing as though slain, right? And so it's not that the, the lion symbolizes one thing and that the lamb symbolizes the other thing. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature and it layers metaphors and the lion and the lamb refer to different facets of the same thing. They're both uh, pictures of, of Jesus Christ. And, and I think something similar seems to be true here in Daniel. God is portrayed as the ancient of days, but then he's also portrayed as one like the Son of Man riding on the clouds to approach the Ancient of Days. And you might think, well, you know, that doesn't make sense that God would approach himself. And yet, number one, the God we worship is a triune God, right? He exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so it may be here in our text that we see a seed for that biblical doctrine. Uh, more importantly, it's also true that this is apocalyptic literature, and you cannot press the analogy too far. And apocalyptic literature works by layering metaphors. And so uh, all of this is to say that the, the vision presents us with a contrast between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom that God will establish when he brings these earthly kingdoms to an end. So uh, we are going to continue in this chapter next week. The chapter actually provides a coherent thought unit. And, uh, I, I, and yet I don't really feel like I have time to cover the entire chapter in one sermon because of the details. And so we'll undertake part two of this sermon next week. Uh, in the meantime, one thing as we think about application, one thing that's evident in our text is that the kingdoms of this world are rife with evil and chaos. Uh, I read uh, one commentator who, who talked about marriage, and you know, marriage is obviously a, a beautiful thing. It's a covenantal relationship ordained by God. The Bible says that he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And, and yet marriage is quite often challenging because when you bring a man and a woman together, you're actually bringing two sinners together, right? Which is a problem. And so, you know, if you desire to be married, you desire a good thing, uh, but don't deceive yourself into thinking that if you get married, then all your problems are just going to go away. And in fact, uh, you, marriage will likely bring with it a set of new problems that you didn't even know existed uh, because it involves the union of two sinners. And if that's true, even in the lives of believers, how much truer is it of non-believers? And when we think about the kingdoms of this world, what we're looking at is not just the union of two sinners. We're looking at the um, union or a, 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 a unified population of multitudes of sinners that are to a greater or lesser degree aligned in opposition to the God who created them. And uh, that's really a picture of these beasts arising out of the chaotic sea. Uh, and yet the good news is that the son of man is coming to bring an end to the evil and the chaos. And when Christ came into the world, he lived a sinless life. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins if our faith is in him. He defeated Satan. He overcame death. He conquered evil and wickedness with the result that a new kingdom has been secured. It's an eternal kingdom in which evil and chaos will ultimately cease. And so when you're uh, tempted to become discouraged because of the pain or the suffering or the evil that you see around you or that even touches your life, remember the gospel. Remember the good news concerning Christ. Uh, remember what Christ has done through his life, death, and resurrection and look forward to the coming kingdom that he has secured on our behalf through his work on the cross. Uh, remember this kingdom of which you are now a part if your faith is in him because the time is coming when he will return and he will bring a final end to the evil that remains. The earthly kingdoms of this world will be brought to an end 
and the kingdom of God will fill the earth from one end to the other. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this truth that you have revealed in your word. We pray that you would help us to think rightly about the kingdoms of this earth. Uh, we pray that you would help us to properly discern what our role in this new kingdom that you have inaugurated is. Help us to be faithful to the mission, to, um, to, to spread the joy that we've come to experience as a result of the gospel. Uh, we pray that you would go before us and ahead of us to do the work that only the Spirit can do in the lives of those with whom we will have that opportunity. And, and we pray that you would help us to live every aspect of our lives in light of that truth, to the praise of your glory. And we ask these things all in Christ's name. Amen.